No. Uh. Hello? Adamu! Right now I'm in Kano. Yes. When I get back, I will just call you. Look, what is wrong with you? I'm talking on the phone and you are gesticulating and doing What's wrong with you? Daddy, where exactly are we at this case? Are you alright? This is Lagos. Well, I just like to someone that we are in Abuja. Keep quiet. Eh? Who told you you can tell an elderly person is lying? Daddy, you just lied. And by lying, you are raising corrupt children for the future of Nigeria. That is corruption, not in my country. Corruption, not in my country. Corruption, not in my country. Come, supervisor. Go and sit here. Well, uh, thank you very much, madam. I'm still very eager to see the school. Oga, you will see the school. Just like others before you saw the borehole and the hospital. And I proved it. The sooner I get through, the sooner I will send the report to the board. Okay. Since you're eager, mm. I'll show you. This is for the foundation. <laughs> the foundation. Good gracious. Oh, this. It's for the decking. This one here is for the roofing. Hold it there, madam. Are you honestly trying to bribe me to approving a school I have not seen, thereby risking the education of the children and the future of this country? How are we supposed to move this nation forward if we continue like this? Not in my country. We have come so that you can help us rally the youth and also share my manifesto. Money, manifesto. <laughs> no, Mazi, the manifesto. I want to be able to tell the people what we are going to do for uh -huh. them. <laughs> Is it uh, this uh, small boy that uh, wants to become a governor? <laughs> Actually, it's my boss here. <laughs> A woman cannot carry this load that we are talking about. Because of a woman, you cannot give me your support. Do you think it is this empty breeze that is, is keeping this to tell me alive? You are actually selling our votes. Mm. Bribing our people. It is only a woman that will call greasing the elbow. Mm. Bribe. Ah, this is corruption. Not in my country. Not in my country. This message is Say that the man be this. If you now vote for him, he could settle that well, well. That the rice and the vegetable be this. It all set. Only to where remain uh, mobilization money. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> 1.85 billion last. Billion. That's what you call last election, no? School, we no see. Hospital, Luka, for where? You don't go, go sell your vote, chop money, claim out. Eh, bring our own money too now. Come on, let's be reasonable now. Oh, yes, now. Especially if you build school and hospital. Make you bring the money. We go build them. Mama, say something. Make you not be like, say, I don't want help. Oh, yeah, now 1.8 last. Yes, sir. This message is from Akin Fadei Foundation with support from Mark Arthur Foundation. Twenty twenty, the one This message is from Akin Fadei Foundation with support from Mark Arthur Foundation. Twenty 
This message is from Akin Fadei Foundation with support from Mark Arthur Foundation. for joining us uh, we are really going to try to keep to time today and we are glad that everyone on this call has joined us for this um, conversation um, on gender inclusive governance um, yeah. women in government. Please, everyone please i would ask um, the rule of engagement is that you all keep yeah. If you are the speaker, so please can we ask everyone to just take a few minutes to put their mics to mute their mics. Thank you so much. Yes, um, please take a few minutes to mute your mic. Um, also would like to say that we are recording this this conversation. Um, so um, it you would you would get a prompt you should have already gotten a prompt to say that you should um, you should. Um, accept the recording. Um, having said that, once again, I want to welcome everyone to this um, very, 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 very important event. Um, and the conversation is on gender inclusive governance, women in governance, uh, women in politics, regard, you know, depending on what language you would, you would love to use. I would quickly go through the rules of the of this conversation, um, I would like to say that please, for everyone who is not speaking, please put your mics um, put your mics um, off. Um, and should you want to um, contribute when we get to the question and answer? So, in terms of the agenda, we would have um, the introductions, and then we'll go to the conversation proper. Um, once we have the conversation proper, we will. We will open the floor for question and answers and um, uh, and contribution. So because it's a conversation that we want to have with you today. Um, and once we have done that, um, you know, at that point, you can, you know, raise up your hands. So please indicate we will unmute your mic for you or ask you to unmute your mic um, either verbally um, or through a message once we are once it's time for you to speak. I'll ask that we respect the current speaker and we do not speak over someone. Um, and if, regardless of if you disagree with the person's opinion, I would also ask that we are cordial in this conversation. Um, it is very important that we, 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 um, we respect people's opinion, regardless of whether we agree with it or not. So you can disagree um, respectfully. Um, so that is my commentary as we commence this event um, 
I would like to say once again, for those joining us, we have had, I can see that we have over 100 people. Um, thank you so much for joining this event. Uh, we are commencing this event immediately. So I would start off um, maybe just by, by way of introduction, maybe say a little of what, you know, for me, why this event is very important. So over a decade ago, actually, um, I, I was working at the time with UN Women and we were trying to, we went across the states and across the political parties to try to include um, affirmative action within the manifestos of the, of the political parties. And so we spent a lot of money, you know, there was a lot of money spent going from one meeting to the other with top key politicians at the time. Um, and, you know, for, for reason of trying to ensure that um, we, we strategically include women, you know, at the core, at, you know, at the, you know, at, um, at very decisive positions, you know. But what pains me actually is that 10 years and counting, this is over actually almost over 15 years um, since some of those conversation for me personally and some of those actions that we took at the time. And I still ask myself, why is the political space still um, hostile against women or for women? Um, and this is just a sad point for me because some of the conversations we had um, 15 years ago, and I'm sure many people here would even say, you know, they have, you know, they have had this conversation over and over and over again for decades. Um, so the question still remains, why are we still here? Um, this is the reason why we have come up with this competition and you'll be hearing more about it as we go because we wanted to turn this conversation on its head to say, this is, you're asking oh, about the competencies of women. This is what women can do. So thank you all again for joining. I'm moving on to introducing our next speaker. I'm glad to introduce this person because this person um, has been um, a form of a mentor to me. I, he, I'm always encouraged by him when I see him speak or when we have conversations. And this is our board chairman, Akifade Foundation. Um, he's also the CEO um, and founder of The Cable, um, an online newspaper. I'm sure many of you know that. Um, so please, um, you can join me to welcome uh, Mr. Simon Kolawale. Thank you so much, sir. You have the floor, sir. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I I work, welcome every one of us to this conversation. Uh, it's something that is very dear to our heart and foundation. It's very dear to me personally, uh, because every time we are looking at what is happening in the political space, and we get we get discouraged all the time by what we are seeing. It's as if when we take one step forward in terms of gender. Uh, inclusion, we take several steps backward. Uh, and so that is why I think this conversation is very, very important so that we can see how, how we can uh, raise the, the volume of this debate so that those who are in a position to act, those who are in a position to, to do things better, we can continue to talk to their collective consciences, we can continue to uh, put them on the spot to realize that this is not uh, how things should be. It is quite uh, sad that when in uh, many developed countries they are talking about gender parity, uh, gender equity, we are still discussing inclusion in Nigeria. Uh, and nothing is more, actually in, in the political space, when we look at, um, for instance, the presidential race, there's no single female presidential candidate. I hope I'm not wrong because the last time I checked, I did not see a single female presidential candidate. Now, uh, compared to 2019, I think we had five, although some of them withdrew before the election. So is it that the women are giving up and say, well, uh, the society is not ready for us? Is it that the male gender is stifling the space uh, such that they are even discouraged from signifying intention? It is not a good development. Even if 
we know, okay, uh, they may not have the resources yet, or they may not have the structure yet, but for them to even completely leave the space, uh, I'm aware someone contested on the ticket of SDP, uh, for the ticket of SDP, and she was not even considered, and SDP is supposed to be a progressive party. So uh, these are the things that should worry us. On the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report, Nigeria continues to drop. The, the report it does on women participation in politics continues to drop. So that's why I'm very happy that the foundation has chosen uh, this particular topic for us to uh, have a conversation around it today, uh, and also to launch the What Women Can Do competition. I think whatever effort we put, no matter how little, it can go a long way. The worst thing we can do to ourselves is to allow this conversation to drop, is to allow the advocacy to go down. I think we have gone too far to, to, to give in. So I welcome everybody. I pray and hope that the conversation will go well and uh, the points that will be made here, will, uh, they, they will be useful to the people who take the decisions, uh, the, the powers that be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Simon Kolawale. Once again, for those who are just joining us, Mr. Kolawale is the chairman of the board Akinfade Foundation. He's also the founder and chief executive officer of the Cable Newspaper Limited, um, popularly known as The Cable. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Kolawale, for your remarks. Um, we will go on quickly to the next um, remark, setting the scene by, Mr., by the executive director and founder of Akinfade Foundation, Mr. Akinfade. Um, thank you so much. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Ola Tony. And thank you very much, our board chairman, Mr. Simon Kolawale, and everyone here present. I hope we can all hear me. I hope we can all hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this is a very delightful event indeed. Uh, the first thing I'll say is uh, for everyone on Facebook, um, I, I did not know that our capacity is 100. I, I'll confess, my, my, my colleagues know that I don't know how to hide secrets. You know, uh, we, did, we, we, we did the pro, which I thought would take us for more than 100. We're fixing that right now. Uh, we're going to pay for more capacity so you can all come in on Zoom for all who can hear me. Uh, this is how I would like to start. Some very, very long years ago, before some of us were born, we had very strong women in Nigeria. Do we all remember a name called Fumila Yoransan Kuti? History has it that when she mobilizes Nigerian women, they come in thousands. There was a time she was asked a question about equality. And she, and she said, Do we all remember a name called and, Fumila And she said, hang on. We had equality before the British was asked came. a question about equality. I can, I can hear myself, guys. Yeah, yeah, she said, guys, we, we had equality before. before. Right. So Fumilai Ransom Kuti said, we had equality before the British came. What is wrong with us today? Do we all remember a name called Flora Nwapa? Flora Nwakpa was a Nigerian author born in 1938, or I think 1939. Flora Nwakpa was called the mother of African literature. She would rather die than be addressed as a feminist. She always believed that when you say I'm a feminist, You've agreed to be socially bound into some bondage that locks you out of equality. She says, no Igbo woman can be a victim when she has a umuna that is a kinsman behind her. Flora Wapa believes that agreeing to be a feminist is your inadvertent agreement or admittance that you are weak. 
Do we all remember the exploit of Margaret Abel? Lady Dose Kuali, so many women, Queen Amina of Zaria, who created a strong army in the North in the 16th century. What happened to us as a nation? Why are our women taking the back seat? What happened to the vibrant, strong culture of political participation by Nigerian women? Why is it that in 1999, till date, we've had House of Reps, we've had the Senate House, and when we have like 109 House of Reps members, we will have three women. When we have senators, we will have just eight women. I have the research, which I'll share with the media. Why is it that Nigeria signed on to affirmative action at the United Nations, but Nigerian government sued against it? Why is it that Nigerian senators of the APC flank, the ruling government, will not agree to have this 35% affirmative action in the Senate House because of cultural and religious constraints? Why do we even keep feeling that we should allot some crumbs from the table power allocation? to Nigerian women. Four things we should identify here. One, there has to be a growing voice and rising profile of women in the economy, community work, and various fairs. There has to be a, an intentional withering of cultural restrictions right now in our perception of what defines how we bring women into public affairs, political participation and policy framing. We have to decide right now that there has to be an expansion of activism, of women organizations, supporting increased participation of women in politics. We have to agree now that there has to be a, that increase of women to take up economic roles, and they shouldn't bear that name of weaker vessel because males are the breadwinners. Nigerian women themselves must support Nigerian women. Some few weeks back or some days back, a Nigerian artist, Funke Akindele, decided to pick up the gauntlet. She stepped out to compete on the platform of one of the political parties. We don't endorse parties here, we're very, very neutral. If I have a political party I'm supporting, I'm not even allowed to mention it in the office. But the point I want to make here is, when Funke stepped out on social media, some Nigerian women were saying, do you think because you're an artist that qualifies you to be deputy governor in Lagos State? That was gross. And that was a shame. Some were saying, oh, you just lost your marriage. Go and fix your home before you think of fixing Lagos. That was insensitive. It is time for us to jettison these mentally self-inflicted barriers. It is time for us to appreciate everything that our four women, four mothers have done. It is time for us to appreciate every effort the United Nations women have put into place strengthening the political voice of Nigerian women. We are the citizens that should rise to this. And finally, it is time for us to remember that Lee Kuan Yew said in his book, From Third World to First, he said, you never have a perfect nation handed to you. Reordering of society must be brought about by you and must fit in to your own peculiar realities. That means power will not be handed to you on a platter of gold. Why you sit down and say, God will help us. No, God will not help you. You have to help yourself. The 
it is time for you, Nigerian women, to remember the old Igbo saying that I'm very fond of, that he who seeks for knowledge and wisdom does not sit in his heart and pray for it to ring from heaven. He goes out in search for it. Our foundation shall work with you to ensure that we showcase you to policymakers. By the time we're done here, we will announce a competition that will not just earn you gifts, that will grant you credible visibility across the world. Let's start this. And let me announce that Kate and Sean Uthal is here with us and it's her birthday. We probably want to wish her happy birthday. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Kifade, for your introductory remarks. Um, we are glad to have everyone here. And as you just said, um, we want to just, you know, use this opportunity to wish Ketensho a happy birthday since she's on the call. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, moving on to our next, I'm going to be introducing our next person, but let me just say something um, from the remark we just had to say that we have a voice, women have a voice. And the, 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 it is high time that our voices begin to be recognized. And we cannot be put aside. We cannot be put on the sidelines. We cannot be, we, they can't give us excuses for why we shouldn't have a place at the table. This is the time to have a place at the table. And we must continue to raise our voices. They are beautiful. Um, organizations and people everywhere speaking on women inclusion um, and this is just joining um, joining our voices to theirs to say that women ha ha need to have a seat at the table. Um, thank you so much for joining us once again. Moving to um, the conversation proper, I'll be introducing our our, our host, uh, our moderator, Mariam Lunge, an on-air personality and anchor of Your View on TVC. Thank you so much for joining us, Mariam. And Mariam will be anchoring our um, session proper. Um, thank you so much to all the speakers. We can't wait to have you share your views. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tommy, for the introduction. Um, uh, good morning, it's still morning here on our side. <laughs> good morning, everyone, and thank you so very much for taking out the time to join us on this um, virtual media event titled Gender Inclusive Governance. Um, first of all, I have to say it's an honor for me to be able to uh, moderate this event, um, this conversation we're having. Uh, we're going to be having some notable panelists and resource persons, and they've taken their time from their busy schedule to share their insights with us um, on the importance of the challenges to women participating in governance today. So personally, I feel that there's no better time than now to talk about um, gender inclusive governance and the role we all play in making this um, women inclusion in politics, a, a concrete reality. I use that because we have had many speeches and um, speeches, you know, by virtue of my job, we're constantly talking and talking back and forth. And we have had so many guests at different um, levels of government come on. And for me, sometimes the conversation just talks and that conversations. I would like to see concrete physical manifestations of this conversation. And I'm looking forward to, to introduce them. And I feel that um, this uh, dream of better um, inclusion of women in politics will be well addressed today. And from there, we can run with it. Also, this event is an opportunity, the Akin Fadei Foundation, is um, unveiling its competition called What Women Can Do Competition. Um, this competition is first um, used, 
is being used to highlight, you know, women's um, contributions, those who feel that they have something to give to Nigeria in terms of politics and government. So it will help to highlight the woman. So this um, competition is asking that um, women from the ages of 18 and above make a pitch one to two minutes um, saying what you can do for Nigeria and there's so many prices attached to you. There's an iPhone 13, there's a wardrobe makeover worth 500,000 and so many more. And um, apart from just this gift, you will get visibility and exposure on you and the things that you can do for our country. So uh, without too much talk, I will go into um, introducing our panelists today. And so joining me today to talk about gender inclusive governance, um, the first person on our list is Mrs. Bami Dele Ademola Olatoju. She is the Honorable Commissioner for Information and Orientation on State. And then we have Dr. Lillian Anomnachi. She's director, executive director, TA Connect, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates. Then we have Dr. Amina Saluku. She's the senior program officer, MacArthur Foundation Nigeria. We also have Dr. Chijo Onuma who is the coordinator of the African Center for Media and Information Literacy, Africa. We have Mr. Simon Kolawale, who is the founder and chief of the board at Kifade Foundation, director, marketing and communications at the New Life Wellness Place in Toronto. We have with us as well, so Dutu Madi, she is Executive Director, Women's Rights Advancement and Protection Alternative, RAPA. We also have Adipula Shutubo. He is the uh, Project Management Expert in the Energy Sector. You're all welcome today. So um, we I also want to use the opportunity um, to acknowledge the presence of Kate Henshaw. It's her birthday today, and she still took the time out to be part of this conversation. Happy birthday once again. I am a huge fan. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, of you, not just your fitness, but that you use your platform and, and lend your voice to the conversation about women. Thank you very much. So without my, uh, you know, too much talk here, um, for me, when I hear gender inclusive governance, as I mentioned earlier about my job, it's a conversation I have nearly every month. And, um, because, and I'm hoping that with this group of panelists, I'll be hearing something beyond just analysis, great speeches and addresses, and about practical steps that we can take as a people, first of all, with the mindset you know, what is, we want a change in mindset that we can see a woman and understand that a woman is capable just as the man. It's about her competencies and her achievements, and she can make the same um, contributions to her community, her country. You know, I want to hear how, as a government, we understand the importance of making policies that give women an opportunity to be to play uh, politics, to sit at the table of power as well, and make their contributions to our, um, our country. And also understanding that when policies are made, they're not just made for paper, but to be, you know, um, to be uh, finally practiced. And um, I hope that um, at the end of this conversation, we would see an improved um, participation in our women and the support from the government as we, um, especially towards um, next year's um, uh, elections, that we'll see better participation of women at all levels of this um, election process. Thank you so very much, everyone, again, and our panelists. And so my first question to you all, 
and I'll take you one after the other, is first of all, what does gender inclusive governance mean in today's, um, in the Nigerian sphere right now? Um, is it just lip service? Is it something that we are sure can be attained? Is this just a conversation we have because, you know, it's politically correct to have it, but uh, as Nigerians, we do not believe that this is something that is achievable or can be achieved. Could we start with Mrs. Bamidele Adimola Olatiju, please? Is she here with us, please? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, um, ma'am. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Miriam Lunge. Good morning. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you to Akinfade Foundation and my co-panelists. Actually, um, in the last four years that I have been engaged in active politics, I have learned a lot of lessons on women, rural poverty, uh, women participation in politics and the entrenched disadvantage to women in politics. To the topic of today, I will say it up front that we cannot achieve um, gender inclusive governance without challenging the patriarchal dominance of political bodies. Why did I say political bodies? I, I use bodies instead of political parties because in politics and in governance, structures are erected against women everywhere. So to challenge this, we must have organized structure as women to push our agenda. And in this, the role of women is very important. As women, wherever we find ourselves on the leadership ladder, we must seize the opportunity and fight for gender responsive governance. What does that mean, for example? It means we must examine the manner in which governance processes are understood through a gendered framework. It means we must put into front burner every issue affecting women. A lot has happened in Nigeria in the last few years. For example, we know that the affirmative action that Akin spoke on earlier was pushed into the Nigerian Senate and it was roundly rejected. For several years since the, uh, the eighth Senate, I think, Senator Biodo Olujimi has been pushing bill into the, uh, to, to the Senate and it has always been roundly rejected. Sometimes it doesn't even see the first reading. You will all recall earlier this year in March, Senator Kazare even made a spectacle. You know, he's very theatrical. He said, women control us at home. If we allow women to control us outside the home, that means we are finished. There's this fear of the woman all over the world, but it's now very, very uh, kind of African. The men feel threatened. There are a lot of things that are responsible for this. Part of it is the destruction of the iron triangle between marriage, contraception, and work. Because women can now control their bodies when they give birth what they do, that has threatened a lot of things because that has enabled women to be in the workplace. For us as women, I've seen a lot in politics. In the last um, two years, for example, women are the ones who sing. We are the ones who are in the chairs for, uh, in, in politics. We are the ones who visit who, who follow these men everywhere. But when it is time for us to participate, that is when they will remember, oh, you are not from here, or you, you married here, or you were, go to where you were born to contest. You cannot contest where you married into. These are obstacles erected against women. For me, I know too, that women too are their own worst enemies at times. I always say that, if there were fraternity of snakes, who will kill them? If you have the most poisonous snakes leading and many other snakes follow, who will kill snakes? Which means if we collaborate as women, who will stop us? Who votes for men? We are more than half the population. We are the one who vote for men. Like I can say, 
when uh, a woman comes up, it is women who we attack the man first. So as women, for us to be able to achieve this, we have to stand up for ourselves. We have to support each other wherever we find ourselves. Anywhere you are on the leadership scale, be it in politics, economy, finance, anywhere, hold that position in trust as a woman and make sure you do not erect barriers for other women to grow. Make sure you hold the position for women and advance the course of women. I'll be speaking more when I'm called again. For me, as the Commissioner for Information in Odo State, I have participated in the, at the grassroots level and I've seen that women do a lot. But women don't even know that they can aspire. But when they, they see a woman who can fight for them, look at uh, our first lady here. She stood firm to make sure that a woman becomes the secretary to the, uh, to the state government. Princess Oladunio is the first woman SSG in Ondo State. She fought to make sure we are eight in the ESCO, women. That is the first time. In a neighboring equity state, where my friend is the first lady, she fought for a woman to become a chairman of council. There are many women who are vice chair, many women are secretaries, and about 45 women as councillors. It has never, excuse me, it has never happened before. Look at uh, Paul, uh, the Paul, Pauline Talent. She fought hard. Anywhere you find yourself as women, fight. Fight, put up a fight for women and stand for women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma. Um, from what I hear from you is that we do not understand our power as women. Yes, there's a patriarchal system, but even as women, we need to work more on understanding that we can to our country. Thank you so very much. Please, I would like to call on Lillian um, Anom Nachi to just give us her opening remarks. I'm sorry I didn't mention earlier, but our first opening remarks will be three minutes per speaker. Thank you very much. Dr. Lillian Anomnachi. Thank you very much, um, Miriam, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Nakin and team. Um, I am not a politician. I am a, a, a executive director, I'm in the development sector. But I just want to make bold to say that what is playing out in the political field um, permeates all the fabric of our society. Um, the last time I checked, we just had about 4% of women in politics in Nigeria. And um, when you think about the number of companies in Nigeria, we have less, even less uh, women um, as boards of directors. We have less women-led organization. And globally, not just in Nigeria, there's a current paradigm shift on, um, to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that is, is a broader aspect to the discussion being had. But for, for, to have a gender inclusive government, um, we need to start, right? We need to start at the beginning. We need to see why are the women not being nurtured? And I use the term nurtured deliberately because there needs to be an intentionality about it. Um, we are not on equal footing. Uh, my previous, my co speaker has talked about the, uh, the, the fact that the, uh, both the political space and government is, male, is a male dominated society. And it starts from childhood, it starts from um, where the gender norms and societal expectations are, are fostered, you know, and you find women being disadvantaged and there are a lot of inequities. So if we take a step back, if we're going to get it right, if we're going to get it right in governance, in politics, we need to um, have an intentionality, which goes beyond um, gender integration. There's, there's a lot of talk about gender integration and have more gender transformative agendas that bring women and women issues to the forefront that puts a deliberate focus on building capacity of women, of ensuring that there's a mentorship system that women mm -hmm. can look up to other women who have been there, who have trod those paths where they want to be, 
you know, and that organizations around the world who support governance, good governance, um, are able to follow in that path. So it's not something that happens ad hocly. It's not something that can happen overnight. We need to have uh, be intentional about it as a country. And we don't need to look far to see countries that have gotten it right. We can look at Rwanda. Rwanda has done a lot. I look at Rwanda, I'm not even looking at the US because despite, despite having a female vice president, um, the US itself has taken certain steps that have put women agendas in the, in the, the back corner in, the recent, in, the, in recent times with the reversal of the rule versus wage um, um, policy, you know. Mm -hmm. So I look at countries like Rwanda. We have almost a 50-50 split of male female ratio in this country. Are we saying there are no, there are no capable women? And that was one of the things that kind of interested me when um, Akin spoke to me about this discourse, you know. So for me, is um, that intentionality, that's going back to say, how do we create a program that has, that has a, a, a gender transformative agenda and not just putting women in governance, but in every fabric of the society where leadership roles um, are, are being played. We all know the role of a woman at home or in the house and how women are said to be better managers, women are said to, to be peacemakers, women are said to actually hold a home together, hold uh, the fabric of the society when things are going wrong or right. What makes us think these same characteristics and qualities cannot be transported, you know, into, into the boardroom, into the to lead organizations, into the into the state houses and things like that. So for me, is putting our heads together to talk about having a gender transformative agenda for Nigeria with an intentionality that focuses on putting women where we want to see them in government. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lillian Anunachi. So um, my next question would have been um, what you have even addressed, just the fact that we're doing so well in other spheres of you know, our um, country, in the private sector, women are doing amazingly well. But I love the fact that you talked about mentorship and intentionality. And um, you, know, you made a, a comment which may seem almost trivial, but it's important. We know how to do the domestic things. And also the commissioner said, we know, we know how to put and serve tea, we know how to arrange the chairs. We're almost intentional about mentoring other women on that level. But when it comes to governance and politics, are we doing as well? Are we being intentional when we do that? Thank you so very much. Um, the next person I would like to just give us your opening remarks uh, is Dr. Amina Salibo. Um, many thanks indeed, um, dear moderator, and thank you to the Akifadi Foundation for this opportunity and a happy birthday to my sister Kit and, and show as well. Um, permit me sometimes to turn off my video um, because of the bandwidth. I, I can see the organizers already have an excellent banner of each one of us and I should have an avatar um, when, when I speak as well. Um, three minutes. Let me thank those who have spoken before me. Um, yeah. But let me turn this conversation on its head a bit to say that we are looking at political participation in the public space as we should, but that is not the starting point. Politics for women does not start from when you come out in the public and say, I want to run or I want to be appointed. It starts from the day you are born female because being born female is conflated with a certain kind of socialization that diminishes the potential of that female child vis-a-vis -a, -vis a male child. Politics therefore begins as a life circle for women and we have to approach it from the life circle um, perspective. And because this conversation is about finding practical solutions therefore, I would take out a practical solution from that life circle learning. The very first point would be the way we raise our daughters and raise our sons. We must raise our sons and our daughters to be the equals of each other. Boys have to recognize that if you can eat, then you can cook. 
that's just an example, so that we demystify socialization just by approaching it from that life circle approach. The second fundamental thing I'd like to put on the table, again, turning this conversation on its head, is that the question should not be, what can women do? Women are doing a lot already. The question should be, can we recognize what women already do and what they can do better? A lot of what women do have already been said, but the question has not been asked. What can men do to support women to attain their full potential? Because there is gatekeeping. At the bottom of it, moderator Longia, you asked about the shape of gender inclusion. And the simple answer is power asymmetry. Full stop, power asymmetry. That's the shape of gender inclusion. It does not exist right now because of the challenge of power. And power is such that those who have resources and the ability to change outcomes dictate what happens. And that happens right from society. I heard the Honorable Commissioner say that. And the society is made up of homes. So we have to pay attention to the shape of politics in that particular space. And to also ask what the gatekeepers are ready to do. I have seen organizings, and again, a practical suggestion. I have seen organizings where men who are very self-aware, who are very feminist like Chido and, and my brother Simon on this call and Akifade, leading by example, by putting together a core of young boys and showing them how to be better men. Real men protect women, they do not beat women. The third idea I'd like to put on the table as an opening conversation is the fact that we can never change the political outcome for women without linking it to the economic, because that is where power lies. Look at the shape of our country, Nigeria. 80% huh? or more of the micro, small and medium enterprises are run by women in this country. And only 4% of that 80%, which is about 40 million, get any form of support. Yet many of us on this call who went to public schools, went to public schools because our mothers, not our fathers, because their father might pay your school fees, but that energy and that support to see you through school probably happened from a female relative of yours who pulled together her bits and pieces here and there and nurtured you and protected you and inspired you to stay in school and was saying that they do not have economic power. If women don't have economic power, they would never get to the boardroom. And I agree with my sister Lillian that the private sector is another place to look. If you do not get to the boardroom, you cannot make decisions. Now look at the pyramid of employment in this anywhere in the world. At the base, you find a lot of women. At the start off point, there's a lot of women. As that pyramid tapers at the top, the women drop off. Why? Um, the commissioner talked about the iron triangle of marriage, contraception, and work because of the control of women's body. Because of the fact that you're born female, you have to be a woman who has to keep the home. Nobody asks what other people have to do. You are saddled with responsibility. You therefore have a poverty of time. Unless we address the poverty of time, women are not going anywhere. Where you have to do the entire house chores, where you have to subsidize the state, there's just one you. And let us not say that women who are at home do not work. They work the most. Women are always working. That's why they have a poverty of time. The tragedy is that the work that they do at home is not rewarded. So a third practical suggestion, we must pay attention to the poverty of time and demand that women's unpaid labor be recognized and rewarded. And that way we can begin to pull what's happening in the domestic into what's happening at the public level. And then when we raise our boys to be the equals of our girls, we will not have a national assembly that was elected to represent everyone. And then they get there and tell us that, we're controlling them at home. Why do you want to control them on the outside? You put yourself forward to be voted for and people have voted for you. And that's another power we have not realized. Over 75% of voters in Nigeria are women. Who are we voting for? Where are we coming out to vote? So in order to recognize that our social capital is a very strong form of power and to turn that social capital into political and economic capital, we need to pay attention to that life cycle trajectory of girlhood to womanhood or to adulthood. And to also think about the opportunity, maybe now, and that'll be my fourth last example of a, a practical idea, technology. We're all connected now by technology, many of us on different platforms. How do we begin to ensure inclusive participation for women, for women using technology? 
technology right now is, is not within the reach of women. It, it will stand the risk of even alienating women more because it was never a level playing field to start with. But there's the potential. And once we've addressed that, all the dimensions of public and, 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 and partisan politics becomes a given. I rest my case. Thank you so very much, Dr. Amina Zalihu. That was a really powerful contribution. Um, I will just go ahead to Dr. Chido Onuma. Please, if you could join us, if you're with us. But I'll just add a little uh, spin on the initial question. Is this your opening remark? But also, I'd just like to understand the role that media has played for and against um, the encouraging and you know, sensitization and awareness of gender inclusive um, governance. Nigerian journalism, Nigerian media. How have we helped it and how have we sabotaged it? Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Dr. Chido Onumachi. It's Chido Onuma, can you hear me? Hello, moderator, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I think the moderator is muted, my brother Chido, but we can I hear can you. hear you. I can hear you, Dr. Chido. All right, All right. okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Aki and uh, the crew for inviting me to this uh, very pertinent conversation about gender inclusion uh, in Nigeria. Uh, the previous speakers have said a lot. There's very little to add, but I'll just pick on two points. Okay, I can hear you. Last... I can hear you now. All right. The la... I'll just pick on two points that the uh, la... two of the many points that my sister, Dr. Amina, uh, spoke about, and that's the issue of socialization and uh, power asymmetry. There is a lot we can do in terms of socialization. How uh, fathers become role models for young boys and young women in terms of how they show, not just tell them, but show them that certain roles, um, that roles in society are meant for uh, humans, not whether you are a man or a female. If, as uh, Dr. Amina said, if you can eat, then you have to learn how to cook. Uh, I'm almost 60, I still cook, I still do the laundry. And I would expect when I do those things, my son does them with me and he understands that it's, he has three sisters and he doesn't see it as a, as a female role. And I'm hoping he will grow up that way uh, to learn and to pass on the message. But that's at the level of family and to some extent society. We really need to look at the bigger picture here for me. Uh, which is the issue of power asymmetry that Dr. Amino uh, spoke about. But I'll kind of take a different perspective from the way she sees it. Uh, in terms of gender inclusion, or ha having a gender inclusive uh, governance uh, atmosphere, whether it's in language, attitude, and all that, I think it's about the polity stupid. Uh, we, we need to ask ourselves what role do women have in our political process. And we need to be deliberate about it in giving women a certain role because again, we live in a patriarchal society and we understand that a lot of things are skewed against women. So we have to consciously, uh, when we talk about uh, restructuring Nigeria or constitutional reform, the issue of gender and the role of women should be on the front burner of that conversation, just as much as we're talking about whether it's the devolution of power to the states or devolution of power, we need to come to an understanding that the role and place of women in social development, in, in, in the emancipation of society as a whole is critical and has to be taken into consideration. So my, my point then would be, somebody spoke about Rwanda Kenya is going into elections sometime next month. Uh, 
after the debacle, was it 2008 elections that almost led the country to a civil war? Uh, they had a new constitutional framework, and part of it is the in the constitution, 47 percent of the seats in the National Assembly are reserved for women and each from the 47 counties. We need to have those kind of examples. It's when we position women electorally and politically, then we'll then have women who can make decisions and take decisions on behalf of women and on behalf of our society in general. And we won't have the kind of situation we had a few months ago where certain bills came up for consideration in a male dominated assembly and as expected, uh, those bills will be shut, those bills were shut down. Uh, quickly to the point about, uh, about the role of media. I don't think our media has done enough. Uh, we, we see a lot of terrible uh, reporting and attitudes in terms of the narrative in, in the media. And uh, Akin spoke about the Funke Akidele issue. Even for mainstream media like The Punch, there's a story uh, they carried and you know, once she declared her intention or she joined the political process and reference was made to her marriage and family, you, you wouldn't have, if the reverse were to be the case, you wouldn't have such uh, men, the, the way they'll be reporting what the man involved in such a situation is will be quite different from the way uh, this, when it involves women, so I think at the end of the day, the role of the media, the way the media reports women, it's or the attitude of the media in Nigeria generally to women is also a reflection of uh, attitude as a country, attitude as a society, and the place of women in our political process. I'll yield the mic for now. Hello. Thank you Thank so much. Um, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Thank you so very yeah. much. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll go on to call on Tracy Jochev. Hello. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you to Akin. Thank you to the speakers before me. I am, I am so excited. I had my um, my three minutes uh, opening remarks very lovely prepared, but all of this conversation has got my mind spinning, and there's so many things that um, that I think we can talk about. Um, and I'm 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 very interested to see how the parallels are working between um, Nigeria and Canada and some of the. Um, the same struggles and challenges and, and maybe some of the same solutions can, can come through from this. Um, a couple of things I wanted to um, reiterate from people who had spoken before me um, around advocacy um, in families, um, even in Canada, I'm 40 Eight. And even as a as I was growing up, um, the the gender roles were there for for boys and for girls. Um, you know, the, the boy cuts the grass and the girl does the dishes, and 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 that's kind of how it's divided. But um, by preparing our children to not accept those roles, I mean, I wasn't accepting them, but it it, uh, it took a while for my parents to see that. <laughs> um, but for for us to prepare our children to to accept roles as human roles and not roles for a particular gender. Um, in terms of uh, political sphere, um, Canada has made good strides very recently with our most recent prime minister. Um, he's a central left-leaning party and in 2015, it was his first year in power. 
and we had the first gender balanced federal cabinet in Canadian history. We were thrilled, 50% women, um, our deputy prime minister, which is like vice president, um, minister of finance is a woman, our minister of national defense is a woman, minister of foreign affairs is a woman. Um, they're, they're doing well, they're being well received publicly for the most part. And I think as more women take these jobs in politics and um, they're helping to redesign the jobs in the ways that accommodate the needs of, of women. Um, one of my best examples of this is for Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, who gave birth while she was in office. And she made it a point to um, acknowledge the reality that she was breastfeeding a, a newborn as she was was still working at the most, some would say, the most important job in her country. So um, she didn't shy away from that. And, and by removing these barriers and stigmas around childcare, it makes it easier for other women to participate, to follow in her footsteps. Um, the other point I wanted to uh, um, support was around allies. So it's amazing to see um, to the men around the table speaking as allies and uh, wanting to support women and not being afraid of um, what they're going to lose by having more women in power because the truth is they don't lose. Uh, my experience is primarily with advocacy for women in sports um, and through my experience when women play stronger roles um, and have more choice in the roles that they play, the game improves dramatically for everyone, not just for the women. The men enjoy the game more as well. So I would imagine that would translate well to, um, uh, sports has done over my life, I would translate well to other areas of, of, um, of civic life. So, um, and then my last point is that um, women need to have the choice. Uh, some of the work that we've been doing around gender advocacy and sport was mandating women must do this and women must do that because it's um, uh, we want them to be equal. So here you are, you're equal, now do it. Uh, wasn't a good strategy. Um, people need, and women need to have the choice and need to feel confident and supported through these mentorships, through leadership courses, through trial and error and practice um, to get the confidence and the experience that they need to actively choose these leadership roles and not be forced into them. Um, that's, that's it. I, you know, I, I agree now is no better time to be doing it than the present. So best of luck to all of the women who participate in this uh, contest that's been kicked off, this competition. I highly encourage you to put together your one to two minute um, uh, blurb or spiel and not only for, for us to see or for the world to see, but also for you to see what you're able to do um, and what skills you're bringing to the rest of the world. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. I look forward to more participation. <laughs> okay, so I, I have an idea. Okay, great. All right. That that's okay. Go ahead, Miriam. I wanted to switch on generator on your behalf in case you've lost <laughs> power. <laughs> Go on. Um, this Mary. is actually similar to me. Um, so I'm still waiting for Mariam to come up, but while we're waiting for her, we can move to the next speaker. Um, thank you so much, Tracy, for those um, beautiful con uh, contributions. Um, we'll go to the next speaker now. So if you can all hear me, um, we would usher, we would um, go to the next speaker, which is Haji Asal Datsu Mahdi. Um, thank you so much. You have the floor, Ma. Thank you, uh, Tommy. Good morning, everyone. And um, my apologies for jumping in. I was also in another place uh, trying to sell the concept of gender in, in terms of uh, the work we are doing with support from MacArthur Foundation, uh, trying to work with the um, ministries, departments, and agencies 
to see the uh, implementation of the national gender policy. Our gender policy has just been reviewed and we've just uh, started working around it at community and national level. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, Akin Fadin Foundation. And yeah, this is the time and it's up to begin to think of what can women do. But I look at it not just as what can women do uh, in terms of getting themselves heard, in terms of getting the spaces for them to, to be, you know, contributors to the development of the nation. But in terms of what alternative things can we do? Um, I'm glad Amina has spoken and I'm, I'm glad also I've listened to Tracy and I picked two or three things from what she said. The way it is in Nigeria and I think across some of the African countries, of course not the very well to do ones that are doing very well, is women need to change the strategy. The claim I saw you saw Olami write that women have numbers, but they are not using them. It's not just numbers not being used. It's also not about being organized. We have seen events in this country that have proven the fact that if women decide to close ranks, a lot of things can happen. And looking at it within the context of the uh, constitutional review process, which is something that was brought up also earlier on, is to say when women Coalesce. when women organize and when they close ranks, they will be heard. But having been heard, will they get what they are asking for? The five gender bills that got thrown out saw over 21 active days of campaign outside the National Assembly of this country. Yet we could not get three brought back. We only got two brought back. And even those two were yet to really say they have serious things. So what can women do truly? Women can step back and probably begin to do radical actions, take radical actions, such as we saw in the National Assembly grounds. One of the challenges to that is that we do not have homogeneity. The only homogeneity we enjoy is the numbers and the, the fact that we have the same sex of women. But because of the differences in so many things we do in this country and most African uh, communities, you find that at the grassroots level, women can be coalesced around poverty, around empowerment. But when you come to the cities and when you come to the elites, you find that there's a problem. And it is the elites who have the resources, who have the education, and who can open the doors that need to lead those women at the grassroots level. So the numbers at the grassroots level can be used to impact that level. But at the national and the state level, where we really need to make the difference, that's where we have the challenge. The second thing about what can women do? Women need to also recognize that, as Tracy says, we have choices. We have choices of who we really want to be. Do we want to be second fiddle? Do we want to recognize the fact that in the makeup of our nature, we are endowed? And what can we use of our endowments to bring about some of the changes we wish to see? The first for me and for many women I have spoken to on this subject matter, is to begin to look inwards. Who am I? And what is a woman in this country? Where does it change? Even within the civil society space, we are still challenged by this discrimination, even by our own brothers who are advocates. When you speak to the faith and culture leaders, they are also afraid of moving out of the frame because they don't want to be labeled. So women have to make a choice of who are our allies and who are those that we can take along and who are those we can win. Once we are able Sorry, did we lose Hadia? I think so. I can hear her. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Madam. I think she has a 
Yes. I think she has a freeze, so I mean. So we'll give okay. a few seconds to see if she'll get back in. But if not, we'll move on to the next speaker. Yeah. So the next speaker is Mr. Adekunle Shotubo. Mr. Adekunle Shotubo is, um, is a policy planner, is a project um, expert, project management expert, is from the oil sector. I know where he works, but he never likes me to mention. <laughs> he doesn't want to get kidnapped by me, I guess. Mr. Shotubo, over to you, please. Uh, thanks for the intro, uh, Akin. And uh, good morning, everybody, uh, panelists. Uh, thanks for... Um, all the wonderful insights into uh, into this topic. Uh, can I just get a feedback that uh, that I'm coming on clearly? Very yes. clearly, very clearly. Okay, just like the other speaker, I am uh, trying to save some bandwidth. I've seen some shift in my in my own uh, connectivity here. So uh, maybe for, just for the intro, I would uh, just um, uh, take out video if you don't if you don't mind. So I'll be speaking from the perspective of industry generally, uh, but a little bit more focus on the extractive um, industry, oil and gas, uh, both um, global and local on this issue of uh, gender um, inclusion in governance and politics. So there is, uh, if you look, you look at what's happening uh, across the globe, uh, the oil industry, um, it's not so different from what you see in, in the Nigerian political space. Uh, I'll probably even say that um, politics is a little ahead of industry at the top level positions where you're talking about executive management um, and of course board membership, et cetera, um, CEO. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, local politics, you've had um, you know, women in, in certain positions that maybe if you were to shift that to, um, especially the extractive industry, uh, you would struggle a bit. But where the um, industry is suddenly doing better than politics and governance is the, in recognizing this gap and being very deliberate you know, as to how to, how to address it. Uh, for instance, I know NATI, which is the Nigerian Extractive Industries um, Transparency Initiative. Um, in one of the pilots last year, they spoke about how 25% uh, of managerial positions in, uh, in the local industry is held by women. Uh, I mean, women make up 49% of the population of the country. Um, they're about even globally, that's kind of the same ratio. So 25% doesn't seem like a lot, but if you look at where we're coming from, uh, there's been some, some improvement, I would say. And then if you also look at um, the results from women or from companies that have women in top management, uh, they are known to have better ROE, which is uh, return on equity. And even overall, better operating results than companies that don't um, have that kind of diversity um, in, their, in their mix at the top levels. So why is this happening? Why are we getting a situation where inclusion of women is showing better results, and yet um, in governance where it is really needed, it is not happening? You know, that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. So if you look at the industry, the um, oil industry, for instance, has made this a business decision globally. So seeing that, I mean, beyond the social aspects of inclusion, it actually makes sense. It makes better business. You know, so what are they doing to tackle this? A couple of things. Um, you have to look at the background. You know, how do you get people rise it up in an industry that is a STEM, a STEM core discipline, if, you, if I must say. It's by getting more women into STEM, more girls into STEM. If you look at the slants between girls and boys, especially in Nigeria for STEM, um, uh, disciplines uh, as against social sciences and other uh, disciplines, you see that there's a big slant where uh, the boys gravitate more towards STEM. So local industry spending um, spending some of their resources in advocacy uh, towards seeing that, um, you know, uh, more girls adopt STEM right from um, high school into college. And uh, we're beginning to see a shift in that as well. The last time we had a couple of um, students coming for industrial attachments. I was glad to see uh, that we, we almost had the same number of um, ladies, uh, young ladies and young men coming in from the engineering field. You know, So uh, I'm seeing that there is a shift already. 
So one other area that uh, the industry is also being very deliberate about, you know, it's in inclusive workplaces. Um, you make this happen by, you know, looking at the conditions. What makes somebody, for instance, uh, rise up to um, a managerial position? What are the objectives? What are the, um, the targets that people are giving? How are they measured? You know, is there any um, un unfair practice where, you know, people maybe stay back at work up to 11 o'clock and then suddenly they are, um, you know, they are rated better than those who have to go home at 4.30 because their kids are going to be back. I have to take care of, um, I guess, domestic uh, concerns at home. So there has to be parity now. people are looked at in performance evaluations as well. There also needs to be flexibility for uh, things like maternity, paternity. What we've seen is that in the past, there's been a more focus towards things like maternity leaves, especially in Nigeria. We're now seeing the IOCs embrace paternity leaves. Some have even taken it up to uh, 10 days. A lot of them have five working days and it, you know, it continues to grow uh, because the idea is that if you also split the time where men stay at home to look after babies, it also frees up time for women to resume early at their workplaces, right? And pursue their careers as well. So there needs to be parity there. And then what other thing, workplace harassment. So the oil industry has a strong element of field work. And we have, um, you know, a, a varied type of people working in the field. And in conditions like that, you really need to look at um, your policies on workplace harassment. You need to look at your, uh, your policies, you know, people, uh, and now moving away from what did I do to what did I say, you know? So the, the, the companies now have policies that actually um, ensure that, you know, it goes beyond just what you did, but even what you implied uh, verbally can be seen as harassment. So this allows women to also have, uh, uh, I guess, uh, freer workplaces for them to rise as well. Uh, and, there's, and there's a lot more that they're doing there. If you look at also the goals that they are getting globally, I would say that BP, um, they are now leaders in this field. What they've managed to do by setting targets is that they now have um, about um, six out of 11 top executives in BP uh, now female. You know, this has uh, been work that has been steadily going on for maybe the last decade, and they've achieved that. They also set the target an aggressive one, that they want to have senior management positions. They have about 120. They want to have 40% of those positions go to uh, the female gender by 2025. And I've heard some of the speakers, they talk about mentorship, uh, um, you know, how women should recognize that they need to also, um, you know, make the workplace easier for other women, mentor them, uh, look after their careers. If you don't have women in positions, uh, the senior executive and senior management positions, uh, you would not really have that number of mentors that are going to work towards pulling the ones that are behind. So this is one, this is one place where uh, they're recording success. Uh, so all in all, I would say that, um, you know, taking this back to governance, there's a lot of uh, lessons that can be learned from the deliberate actions that the energy industry is taking. And uh, um, maybe later when we... Uh, go into deeper discussions. We will look at countries um, on the governance um, um, uh, area and see how the uh, how Nigeria can learn some things from there. And how the oil industry um, deliberate actions as well can be um, uh, best practice also for governance here. Uh, thank you. Adekunle Shotbo. Thank you very much, Mr. Adekunle Shotbo. I'm so sorry. I need to apologize for the breaking transmission. Um, the network, I had to try and see if I could get on another one. Thank you so very much. Um, but well, before we round off the um, first stage of this conversation, I would like to call on Mr. Simon Kolawole for his opening remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, because of bandwidth issues too, I think it is, I, I noticed that Zoom works better without the video. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, I have been well uh, educated and enlightened by contributions by other speakers. And um, uh, this is something that should keep us going in this conversation. Now, I'm not changing the topic, but I just want to digress a bit. My worry is not so much about gender inclusive governance now, but the statistics that are coming out now, 
tend to show that we are going backward on many fronts. We mm. had made some progress in the past. Uh, I remember there was a time when uh, President Goodluck Jonathan was president. We had about 30% of the cabinet being uh, female ministers, and we were celebrating it. Um, then suddenly it started dropping. I am sure by the time he left government, we had just about seven ministers who, who were women. And under President uh, Muhammadu Buhari, it's, 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 uh, it's also been very discouraging. Recently, seven ministerial nominees, uh, the names of seven ministerial nominees were sent to the National Assembly uh, because of those who resigned to pursue political ambition. And none out of the seven, none, if I'm making a mistake, please correct me, not one was a woman. So we now have a cabinet of 43 ministers, only seven are women. That is not a sign of progress. In the House of Representatives, we have 18 female reps out of 360. If your child comes home with 18 over 360 in an exam, you are not going to say, oh, well done. Um, in the Senate, we have eight female senators. I even hope that my statistics are still correct because people are dropping out one after the other. Today, only one major party is fielding a female governorship candidate, which is good news as far as I'm concerned. Uh, in uh, Adamawa, uh, Adamawa State, the APC candidate, uh, Aisha to Binani. Uh, of course, people started raising, oh, she bought it, she bought it. Well, cry me a river. Um, <laughs> there is no female presidential candidate, like I, as I've noted before, compared to 2019. It's not a sign of progress that we had four, five, four years ago, and now not one. Uh, we've never had a female secretary to the government of the Federation. Uh, we've never had a female Senate president. We've never had a female deputy Senate president. We had a female speaker, uh, Patricia Ete. And if you ask the typical person on the road now that why was Ete removed as speaker? They was oh, she stole money. Ete did not steal a cobble. At the end of the legislative year, they apologized to her. She did not take a cobble. Some people just felt that a woman cannot be speaker, that they cannot subject themselves to the leadership of a woman in the House of Reps. And the group was led by uh, Farouk Lawan, and they started saying integrity group because they did not want a woman as speaker. Please go and find out what I've said. Don't take my word for it. They apologized to her. You can even Google it. They apologized to her at the end of the session. So we, instead of, we've made progress by having a female speaker. And then we went backward. So not even a female deputy speaker. Now, I am not someone who likes lamenting. I believe that we should always move from lamentation, from the lamentations of uh, Jeremiah to the songs of Solomon. But I'm a bit uh, discouraged by the kind of data coming out uh, from in the political space. So how do we address this? Is it to make new laws, have more laws, so that they will be compelled to do the right thing? I, I believe in the efficacy, I believe in the efficacy of laws, but when we are talking about gender equity, gender equality, when we are talking about even gender parity, because I don't know why it cannot be 50-50, we can go through the legal route, but you have we, have we are still not addressing the foundations of the problem. For us to see that a woman can be president, a woman can be governor, a woman can be anything that she wants to be. That is where we should address the issue from. Because if we talk about law, some people are just grudgingly obey the law, but they are still not convinced that this is how it should be. So thank you very much. Uh, that's, those are my initial remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Sam Kogawali. Um, so the next part of our conversation will be to you know, have other participants ask questions of our panelists and make their contributions. Um, and so to start this off, I just have a question to ask our panelists and participants. Um, I have heard everyone and what I hear that just keeps repeating itself is one, the way we're raising our women, um, then the conversation about allies, the way we're raising our men and how they see us and, you know, also policies, but, um, and I've seen, you know, the uh, information shows that in Senegal, in Rwanda, 
when policies were made, were put in place, they saw um, in two years, in five years, in 10 years, increased female and women participation in governance. We have a policy, we've got affirmative action. And we saw what happened at the National Assembly. We had allies there, we had women there who did not, you know, they, they did not feel, or did not have the, um, the confidence, you know, in that bill. So my question is, have we gone way too far in the way we have raised our allies? Have we, um, the, the corruption that, you know, permeates our elections, our politics, has that sort of affected how policies should eventually um, reflect, you know, in our everyday lives? Is corruption really the problem? Or is just as simple as the way we're raised? I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, and before that question is answered, I am going to be pushing a direct question to uh, the Honorable Commissioner uh, for Information and Orientation from Mundo State, Mrs. Bamide Lolateju. I would like her to, I, I picked a peculiar interest in what she was talking about that's currently going on in Ondo State um, about the influences of um, the state governor's wife to ensure that um, the secretary to the government is a woman, which is quite commendable. So that's for me raised a question and that is the question of intrigues of politics. Um, I would like her to shed light on, on this for everyone, increase of in, 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 in intrigues of politics, lobbying and power play, if you like. And um, she should speak. She should speak to this and and figure into this conversation political perspectives uh, with regards to how women can access power. I think um, this was meant to be part of her introduction as well. That was uh, missing because of how we coordinated. Ms. Salateju, please. And then uh, we can have anyone from the panels answer Miriam's question. Thank you. Thank you, Akin. First of all, I would like to say that change is incremental. And any form of growth that is not organic cannot work. When we want inclusive governance for women, we have to make it organic. In my experience, for example, we know that this, every, this situation is just stacked against us. For example, in politics, the meetings are often nocturnal. As a woman, you want to go to a meeting at 12 midnight, it is men who fix these meetings. So as a woman, what will your husband say to a meeting that will be taking place at 12? If you have a growing young family, Will you leave your children to participate at such nocturnal meetings? These are questions. And when it comes to lobbying, to the intrigues, to everything in politics, because we are new to the table, we are often excluded. And what I have observed, again, is the structure of power. Fundamentally, men and women are different. Number one, we know the biological imperatives. Number two, we know the physical imperatives. But I must say that the way we build power is something we women should begin to look at if we want to be powerful, if we want to lead, if we want to be successful in politics. How do I mean and what do I mean? Men build power from the bottom but I have seen and observed that women build power from the top. For example, a man who went to primary school, secondary school, university, and so on, each at every layer of life, every ladder, he strings his acquaintances and friends along from primary school to secondary school, to university, to his uh, sports association, the, uh, Boys Association, the, the church or the mosque, 
He strings them all along. So he keeps building the pyramid right from the bottom. As women, we must learn this. You cannot be scrapping your friends and your acquaintances and expect to be powerful. Because politics is, a, is, is about numbers. It's about how you can, you can gather the numbers. So for, for example, we women, once we are in secondary school, we forget people we knew in primary school. Once we get to university, we forget those we know in primary and secondary. Once we become commissioners, yes, we only make friends with commissioners, special advisor, or whoever is in government. To be powerful, you have to grow. You have to maintain growth. And you have to keep amassing the numbers. And again, we are successful in education because we, we put in the work. To be successful in politics and in leadership, you have to put in the work. Men are not smarter, they are not better. We can be smarter, we can be better. In terms of intrigues, see the way we organize our home, see the way we solve problems. I don't think men are better at managing intrigues, conspiracy and all that, better than women. It's just that we are not present at the table. So when you have that opportunity to be at the table, pull your weight. Again, you can be part and parcel of the boys. You can be part of the boys' network. But don't forget to string women along. I mentioned it earlier. When I was working for uh, Mr. Governor to be elected, what did I do? I went to all the women in my local government. I spoke to them. I told them that if you elect the governor, I will be your voice. I can speak for you. I can go to him and say, the women voted for you. And up to now, that is what I keep telling them, that since I'm there, that means you are there. I will make sure your interests are protected. So if you want to be powerful, we have to organize. That was what I said in the first instance, that for us as women, what does it mean to be inclusive? What it means is that we need to challenge the patriarchal dominant, dominance of political bodies. And we need to challenge it by having a well-organized movement, by not giving up. Several of my speakers emphasize that. We cannot give up. We keep presenting our case. Uh, one of the speakers, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name. She said, probably we have to take radical actions. I support Hello. that. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, please. I hear yes, you now. Please. please go on. Yes, please. Okay. I support that. We sometimes have to take radical actions, not violent actions. We can occupy the spaces. They are, everybody has a wife, a sister, a mother, an aunt, a sister, and so on. So we project ourselves and work for ourselves. I asked a question, who are the people voting for the men? It is the women. We have to not push the blame all the time. It is the men who did not allow us to do this. It's the men who did not allow us to do that. In my state, slots were reserved for women candidates for, uh, for, for House of Rep. Amazing. Now, no woman is going to the House of Rep. Why? The women voted for men. Mm -hmm. They voted for men. They didn't vote for the woman candidate. If they had voted for the, uh, as, uh, the delegates, the women delegates have voted in mass and recruit the he for she's, the, what would they, those we call allies, it would be a different, uh, it would be a different case. So in, in essence, the evolving role of women with the aim or with the expanding notion of governance need to include that neglected half. I did mention, men are afraid. How do we allay the fears? They are afraid. Kazare said it. He said they are afraid that we are taking over. I've had it from many men. They said, what do you people want? Now we have gender offices in many states. We should use that opportunity. Allay their fears. The reason is that women are making money. Women are becoming breadwinners. Men don't like that. But how do we use that power, that financial power that we are now getting 
we need to understand how to navigate the dynamics of power and not project it in a way that threatens men. Thank you so very much. So that's, that's what I have to add. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma. And then just to say again that um, this law is open for contributions from anyone, whoever um, is interested in making a contribution or asking a question, please just indicate by raising your hand. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have a uh, Mary Fikayo. Hello. Yes. Hey, please, what's your contribution? Mary Fikayo. Are you with me? Yes, we can hear you. Can everyone hear me? Hello. We can hear you, Mary. Please go ahead. Yo, the, our protocol daily observe. I really thank Mr. Kintaki and all the and our Okay. Madam Ba, thank you. Madam Ba Mideli for representing us well. God bless you. Yeah, our protocol duly observed. And I just want to say this. I've listened to everyone and they've all really, they spoke very well. And it really eats me as a person. And I feel challenged to do more. I feel challenged to speak more. I wish I had a girl child. I would have raised her in a way that she would become the best with all the mentalities that we were brought up with. And in this way, I think we are all talking about women, women, women. Yes, women must be inclusive. But do you know that a girl child is, a, is the one that will grow to be a woman? So they, 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 I think we should start by catching them young. Let's catch them young. Let's carry this campaign to our primary school, secondary school, tertiary institutions. Women inclusive in society, let them know that they are important. They are the backbone. Men may be regarded as the head, but head cannot stand without the backbone. It will not stand. So let us, let the orientation be there for our gay child. Let's carry out the let's, we can we can form a, 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 a club for our female girls in schools whereby we orientating them as they are growing because teach teach an adult is rigorous, but when you inculcate a mentality in a girl child, it, she will grow with it. And by the time she become a woman to be inclusive to participate, not to be intimidated, not to see herself as weak or inferior. It will be easy for her. So all these things- Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Mary Fikayo. I think we have learned from that, that we should learn to raise our daughters differently so that those limiting beliefs, you know, will not stand in their way of participating in government and also our allies. Thank you so very much, Mary Fikaya, for your contributions. So I'll be calling on Yusuf Olami next. Please remember that your contributions or questions should take only one minute. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon, sorry. Um, thank you to all the speakers so far. Um, Personally, personally for me, I am one of the women advocates because I was raised by a woman. And like I said in one of my um, comments, personally, if my mom and my dad are contesting for a political office, definitely I'm going to co consider my mother before my, my father. I know them both. It is quite easier for women to get things done than it is for men. Some call me women rapper. I know what I've seen. I know how this is being done. But the question is, are the women ready? A woman used 100 million Nigerian money to purchase an APC presidential form only for her to go on stage and tell us that she knows Nigeria needs a mother at this present time and she eventually stepped down for someone that is above 75. Who does that? Like, I don't know. Some women have um, turned themselves to political talk. They just want to be used. They don't even care. 
So I think this. So sorry, I'm, this I'm, 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 so, I'm so sorry to stop you. Hmm. Just, just we we'll, we'll probably need to modulate uh, the kind of um, utterances uh, we're making use of. Um, I'm, I'm a very, very strong advocate of um, mutual respect, you know, within a civil platform. So, I mean, I, I know you don't mean any harm to any woman, but again, let's just modulate how we use our words, you know, thank you so much. So we don't call any woman a political sog, right? Thank you so much. Right. All right, all right, all right. Um, I apologize for that. I apologize for that. So um, I'd like to continue. Like, if we are to start addressing this, we have to start from the women themselves. They have the numbers, they have the capacity. Like, if I start a business today and a woman start a business today, I can assure you that she's definitely going to prosper in that business. Before myself, you, you have the ability, you raise children, like, you, uh, you contribute more to the home than the men. And whatever is happening out there, we can eventually peg it on the women. So you guys need to stand up for yourself. Then we will support. A lot of us are willing to stand for you because we believe in you. So if we are to start um, advocating for women, women should start advocating for themselves. Thank stand you very much, Mr. Thank you so we much. We trust for your you and we believe in you. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, so the question is also, he's asking, are women ready? Um, and they would like to see that women show, um, you know, that they are ready some way and then the allies can come and support. Thank you so very much. I've got other people on, but first I'd just like to give an opportunity to anybody, um, one of the panelists, the discussants, would you like to respond to his question of are women ready or should I just go on to hear the next contribution? Okay, so I'll... Hello. Lillian. Okay, all right, Dr. Lillian. Can, can I just say that um, I believe that women are more than ready in response to his question, however, there are certain things that um, keep them at a disadvantaged position. Um, it's not every state, um, like the Honorable Commission has said, that probably have those slots or things re re reserved for women. And if they were reserved for women, um, then perhaps women should have been coached into those positions or prepared for those positions. So it's not. It, like I said earlier, it's not and something you know, that happens. Just leave those small, small ones. Just come on, you know. Uh, please, please mute. Please mute. Please mute. Let's mute, please. Yeah, it's not something that happens um, ad hoc. So there's a, there, there has to be preparation, right? For preparation to meet opportunity, you know? So there, there has to be that intentionality. I keep going back to that word in coaching, in grooming women for those positions. Whether we like it or not, there are societal inequities that exist um, between what a woman has access to and what a man has access to in our society. There are societal norms. Women take time off for childbearing, they lose pay, there's pay gap and all those things. You know, they lose pay, they lose position in the workplace, they lose in whatever advancement of their career path. So there are certain things that kind of keep a woman in a disadvantaged position. Is it that there are not women that are capable? There are, but then there needs to be a deliberate attempt to bring such women to the forefront and to mentor and groom them for such positions. Um, I, I don't know if a lot of women, just a handful perhaps, would, would have the, the wherewithal to do the money politics. That, um, that permeates our society today, you know? But if it were on a, a, on a level playing ground, I would tell you that the women are ready. There are women there, we need to do more definitely because um, it's like a pipeline. There are few that have attained uh, positions where you can easily, with little coaching, put them in such positions or aid them in getting to such positions. But, like other speakers have said, it is a pipeline. We have to start from the families to challenge the gender norms and 
societal norms. We have to start from the schools to make sure that their leadership capacity are groomed and things like that before they even get to the point of um, being in governance. So Thank we are so ready, much. but there's a lot of work to be done. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Lillian. Um, I will Madre, call on our next one. Okay. Um, may I jump in or? Okay. Sure, Dr. Amina Sali. Uh, many thanks indeed, and please permit me to keep my, um, my video turned down. Uh, let me begin from the intervention from my brother Simon Kalaoli and his exasperation with the situation. And to say that one of the strategic things we're learning in the women's movement is to redefine winning. We have redefined what it means to win. And so winning is not always when you get into office or you get what you want, but the energy to even engage the ability to come out and say, I have made the choice to run. The ability to also understand the positives that are changing and to be mindful of them, otherwise they will regress. These are strategies that we have kept in view. So for example, since 1999, the number of women who have aspired for office has steadily increased. It has never dropped, whether at the councillorship level, whether at the and the state has of assembly, you know, or at national assembly, that number has consistently grown. And that is a data, you know, for the media to help pay attention to and to amplify and to show the power of possibility in there. We have so many organizations now that have gender policies that we didn't have before. Um, it was in this country that um, a, a governor of the central bank made the conscious decision. My sister Lillian talks about intentionality to say that, look, every board of every bank must have at least two women directors, and they found the women. So it is not that the women are not there. It is about when we find ourselves in certain positions, what we do with the opportunities that come to us. My brother Shotibo talked about the need to make the workplace, the, the, the formal workplace, a safe space for, for all women and all men. And, and that is a very important thing, because if we're looking at work as divided, we're looking at work as something unpaid in the house and work that as something paid outside the house. And we're not connecting the two. We would never be able to grow a new generation of women and men who can support each other to really reach their full potential. So connecting the biological work of women with the social work of women is very important. And the point that was made about paternity leave becomes a very strategic thing um, to also think about. I wanted to speak quickly to the use of the law and, and the way it has worked for the women's movement. And I can almost say that if my sister, um, Hadja Saudit hadn't dropped or should have made this point. After the 2019 elections, the Nigeria Women's Trust Fund, um, she and I are members of the board of that trust fund, took the government of Nigeria to court to challenge the government for not um, keeping to its own policy of affirmative action 35%. And there's now a subsisting court judgment saying the federal government was wrong. All that we're waiting for is to get that court judgment. And some people are probably trying to ensure that that does not happen, but rest assured it's going to happen. We will get that court judgment and it becomes a point of advocacy. If we get that court judgment in hand, and to my brother Chido's point earlier, what will the media do with it? I guess I'm throwing that question back to all of us. What will the men who are our allies do with it? What will we ourselves as women do with it because if there's something we have not done very well it is to organize across differences as women but we are organizing we are organizing and i would like to appeal to everyone on this call all of us to be very careful um, of the kind of language that we use because language is power and sometimes you might think it is harmless but it is very harmful I would like to see the measure of people who are very self-aware and very conscious of gender equity and social inclusion use language that recognize that we're not just he, we're also he and we're also she. This is very important. It is not trivial because when it comes to discrimination, the distinction is usually made clearly and then the right prepositions are used. Second is to never blame the victim. And there are two ways in which we blame the victim. One, um, which connects to the work of Akifade Foundation is in terms of sexual and gender-based violence, where the fact that women, girls, and even boys are diminished in the home space through rape, through all forms of domestic violence, including battery, and we blame that person for maybe stoking the man, for maybe showing that she has the income, and therefore annoying the man. 
I think that is very counter our agenda because we are, first of all, both equally human. This is what we need to celebrate. If a woman has the means to provide for the family, it is no big deal because it is your family. And it is not anybody's business who's providing for that family, right? Because the man also has the means, the man should also provide for the family. The same way that women experience violence, men also experience violence. A man loses his job. He cares for his family like nothing else, but he loses his job because of the bad economy and society begins to dehumanize that man. That is also violence against him and that's going to have a repression effect. Again, we must emphasize our humanity in all ways and no one is more superior to the other. And so I wanted to give that example of language. I'm, I'm very sorry, my sister Mira, because I need to exit shortly. That is why I asked for the space to have this conversation. The other dimension in which you know language also becomes very powerful is because we're also talking about the media in this context. And it is the kind of the kind of networks and the kind of reportage that we have. So we talked about the fact that women lose their network or women don't know, know how to network. Women do network, but do you know why women lose their network? When you are a girl and you're called a miss, when you become an adult, society does not recognize that there is an expression for an adult woman. The assumption is that when you move from a miss, you become a missus. In, in having to satisfy society to become a missus, you lose your personhood, you lose your identity. In many cultures which are patriarchal, you're even expected to change your name. If you change your name and you used to be Amina Salihu and then you became Amina Fadei, who is ever going to know that it's the same Amina Salihu when they were in secondary school? We lose our networks that way. I am a Muslim and I'm very conscious of the fact that except it is a matter of choice, we do not need to change our names. And when you can't find each other, you lose your networks. So we need to teach our girls to aspire. We need to allow our girls to have negotiation skills. My brother Aki, when those young girls and boys that you want to nurture come together, teach them negotiation skills. If they're going to go into a relationship, let them think about prenuptial arrangements. The longest verse in the Holy Quran, my sister Sodet Maldi would, would bear me witness, is also in the longest surah, Surah Al-Baqarah. And it talks about the importance of contracts and documenting contracts. We do not allow our girls or even our boys negotiate relationships. We push them because we think the status misses is an achievement. It is not an achievement. A marriage is only a marriage when it works, when it is happy. And so, so we yeah. need to think, I'm, I'm rounding up now. We need to think therefore about that ability to negotiate and to have voice and to have power. Because unless we do that, we're not going anywhere. Um, I see my sister Saudati is back now and when she has her slot, I'm sure she'll tell you more about the court case and how we're trying to use the law to actually force the affirmative action um, policy. But I'll stop here because I knew I've taken more than five minutes. I thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. and, just, and, just, you. and just before you take over, Miriam, I want to say thank you so much to Dr. Amina Sali. Um, for, you, for all of the, all of you saw our flyers out there, you kept seeing with support from Akato Foundation, with support from Akato Foundation, all the work we do, our capacity to bring interventions to vulnerable women in Nigeria and young girls, we're all funded by Makato Foundation. Um, all the work we're still going to do will be funded by Makato Foundation. Dr. Amina Salu is one of the most dignifying human beings I've met in my entire life. <laughs> you know, and uh, you could see her calling everyone, my brother, my sister, my brother, my sister. It's not a chariot. That's what she will do even when you link with her on the phone. She's so wonderful. Thank you for all the support from Makato, Dr. Amina Salu, and give our regards to Dr. Kole Shatima and all our colleagues uh, in the partnership. We really appreciate you for joining us uh, on this Thank call. You for the let me, let, sure, yeah. sure. And let me assure you that um, you asked a critical question. What will the media do with the court judgment that we're expecting, that we do believe will be positive? We will galvanize that space. It's, it's already we'll positive, galvanize, my brother. We'll galvanize, we, we'll galvanize that space. Uh -huh. Thank we will you. galvanize that space to ensure that it's out there. Number two, we have plans now to use our studio to commence a very aggressive mobilization of Nigerians to understand the Electoral Act. 
everything it says. Before 2023, Nigerians will be well informed. We know we're literally taking on the job of National Orientation Agency, but we're working in concert with them to ensure that citizens are well educated. Because if people don't know, then they lack the power that information should place at their disposal. We've set up the studio. We've set up all the electronic um, tools and instruments with which will be live streaming, presenting everything Nigerians need to know about the forthcoming election, about the Electoral Act, about their rights. We're also going to use our flag it app. We're going to deploy it in this election such that you can report incidences from polling votes and sent to us. We have a whole lot coming up. And like I said, everyone on this call should hang on, don't go. We have a very big announcement to make that will showcase your capabilities to the world. You might just pick your next political appointment from this project we're about to launch. So stay tuned as we go on. Thank you so much. Miriam, go on. Thank you so much, Mr. Fadi. Um, we'll take one last um, contribution for those who've been raising their hands. And I will take um, Mr. Kai, the Akin Robo, please. Do remember it's one minute and for every other person who's raised their hands, please could you send your contributions and questions to the group and we would attend to them after. Thank you very much. I'm please so sorry, Kai. Miriam. I'm so sorry, Miriam, because Kayade is my friend. Let me cheat him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let me cheat so him. So let me take Ade I, Ade, I'm so sorry. I, I like I like to call um, Mr. Dakorotifa for this reason. Okay. He joined from the diaspora. He didn't sleep just so he can be at this event. Just as um, Tracy Dochev, uh, the executive director for New Life, uh, New, I mean New Life Wellness Place in Toronto. Um, I mean a lot of a lot of my friends from the diaspora had to just stay awake just so they could be part of this. So I like us to just uh, give them priority, I'm so sorry, not because they're from the diaspora, but because they sacrificed to be part of this. But trust me, you, you'll be given opportunities to contribute, those of you that are on this call. Let's just make sure we manage the time well, because our panelists will still have to respond to your questions. Um, Uncle Dako, please yeah, you have the floor, sir. I'm still here, Aking and Miriam. I've managed to steal somebody's uh, Network. <laughs> <laughs> no problems. I just so that too. Okay. You, we're happy you stole it. Nobody will prosecute you on my watch. It's just sad. be here. Just be here uh, yeah. while Uncle Dako takes the floor. Uncle Dako, uh, it's it's okay. over to you now. Yeah. Is Mister Dako Rotifa? Can you hear me or is he muted? Sorry about that. Um, I didn't know I was muted. Okay, sure. uh, I was going to say it's not a big deal that we deny ourselves some sleep just to be part of it because it's very critical and um, we have big respect for you and for what you're doing and for your team. Um, so Dr. Amina Sally will talk about uh, um, women making about up to 75% of the voters in the country. I just, uh, Madi talk about uh, uh, allyship and um, Chiba Midele share experience of governizing women at uh, in Ondo State. And so, which really worked for her, and I want to um, my contribution is about allyship for women. How can they governize themselves to form political allyship with a particular political party? They do it here in the United States. Okay. Um, I think in the current uh, Congress, we have about uh, two, about 24 senators, and we have 16 of them are from Democrat and um, the Republican produce only eight. And in the Congress and the House of Representatives, I think we have about 123. 90 of them are Democrats, who are about just a third of it from um, Republicans. So you will see that uh, 
for a very long time, the women group, the women have seen Democrats are promoting their interests uh, more than Republicans. The Democrats gave us the first vice president, first uh, black um, uh, Supreme Court judge, I mean justice, and uh, even the first uh, black senate, women senator came from the Democrats back then. So urban women here, they have seen that no matter what, we're talking about uh, uh, abortion something now in the United States, and you see that Democrats are in the forefront fighting for women's rights. So my question is to Chiba Midele, what you did in Nondo State to governize women towards your political party, how can that be replicated on national level? So that women will not, I'm not recommending whether it's APC or PDP, but women can start, start to form some allyship with some political parties that cater for their interests. And then that's where they should be directing their vote for, to. Uh, Biden will not have been president today without contribution of women. So we need to start to see that. I can, what you did be replicated on the national level. Thank you. Yeah, All right. Thank you. Thank Should you I very answer? much. I don't know if I, I just would like to use this opportunity just because of time to say that um, if uh, we've had some of our panelists who haven't said anything beyond their opening uh, remarks, uh, we have Tracy Dutchev. Uh, I would like um, so Dr. Madi, Dr. Chido, and Dr. Uh, Mr. Um, Adikule Shotubo to um, make their closing remarks, one minute closing remarks, and also maybe um, attend to the last um, question in your closing remarks. Thank you. So, um, Tracy, Dr. Jeff, would you like to start? Okay. Okay, if she's not there, could we have um, Dr. Saudit Badi? Okay. Would you like to go? Okay, good, Tracy. Oh, Tracy's Thank back. You. Yep, okay. sorry, I was talking with my mute on. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I was saying it was a lovely um, experience for me um, to hear all of this so much similarity with what I have experienced in Canada. Um, uh, women across the world um, experience similar uh, things. Um, one final point that I wanted to um, uh, support was from Mr. Shotubo about um, the need for harassment policies in the workplace. Um, and that is something that we've experienced in Canada is that when women get into politics, um, the vitriol that they are um, the recipients of can be quite incredible. Um, death threats, um, uh, rape uh, threats, violence threats, uh, there, it's not a, a safe space for them to be working. And so I think that may be one of the challenges that um, we face, I don't know about in Nigeria, um, that we, we need not only the, uh, it is a workplace. So how do we make this public space, which is a workplace, how do we make it safe um, for people to be willing to do the things that they need to do to um, ensure equity for, for us? So that was my final comment. Thank you again for the invitation and um, looking forward to hearing the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, could we have um, Dr. Sauda to Madi? Thank you, Miriam. I'm not a doctor. I'm just Sauda to Madi. <laughs> oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> I'm not. Um, I, I think I'll just quickly wrap up what uh, Amina has said I should do. You know, she's our boss. She left an assignment for me to talk to the issues of trying the legal waters for changing the dynamics of women in politics in Nigeria. Uh, when we hazard the, the, the attempt, uh, it wasn't easy. Some challenges came through about can we take the government to court? Uh, because in the 2003 and the 2007 elections, we attempted to have women from their political parties who were you know, disenfranchised, whose mandates were taken off them 
after the primaries and before the primaries to go to court so that we can try the legal waters. It didn't happen because again, the women are not sure. Can I make it across the party? Would I be able to get a position should the party win the elections? All the ifs were there. And of course, what everybody keeps saying, the numbers did not work. Uh, the affirmative action legal case against the federal government is a landmark case. And if, like Amina has said, we're able to sell it and we can use Akin Fade, we can use the media of Nigeria, we can use our own platforms to really propel. We are waiting for the, um, uh, what do you call the certified true copy of the judgment so that we can pick out the pieces that can be the message lines for us to tell Nigerians that it is no longer okay for the federal government to lay a blind eye to its commitment in the constitution, uh, you know, and also in its commitment at international levels. The second thing I want to also um, address is uh, in terms of politics, is women's cohesion. Like I started saying before the network failed me, when women coalesce, we saw what happened even at the grassroots level in the end in, 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 with the Ebenebe women who rejected the bribe from the political parties and stood by the candidates they believe will represent their interests. So if more of that can happen, if we can get people to understand that when women speak as one voice, we must be listened to and we can be listened to. The third thing I'm also thinking around and saying we need to address is the political parties themselves. Nigerian politics and politics the world over is based in the political parties. Our political parties do not yet believe because they're afraid of what they say is at the grassroots level where they need to win their elections. They do not believe a woman can be a candidate that wins their election. And I think that is being put to the test because even as we speak in Zamfara state where for the last six elections, a woman has never stood an election. A woman has stood and gotten a gubernatorial candidate ticket. It may not be a big party. It may not be a reality, but the fact that we have won and that's when Amina speaks to winning, I mean, the redefining winning. We define winning by how many barriers we have been able to overcome. One of them is the notion that uh, religion or tradition will not allow us to excel. So women need to coalesce, women need to have cohesion. And then the most important is, is this safe and decent? Many women shy away from going into politics because it is defined as a dangerous game. It is a game for vagabonds, some people say, I think this is not uh, with any direction to anybody but they say it's a dirty game. And women probably would not want to play dirty games. Or we can change the narratives. When people refuse to put their sons and daughters into their campaigns, it means they know that they want to do the evil by giving narcotics to the children of other people to be thugs and vagabonds for them. So we need to, as women, show the way and make politics safe and decent. It is not enough that the man who has stolen so much money or the, 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 the political godfather who has spent so much on money on any candidate can come and decide what happens. Women have to come out and really, really make the space safe. And I like the, the notion about alliances uh, from our brother uh, who, who spoke to alliances. It, up to the 2015 elections, we tried to form alliances with at least five major political parties. But what would happen? Yes, they had it in their constitutions and their manifestos, but to implement became an issue. So again, we have to go back to the legal waters. All in all, I think what women need to do is one, organize. Two, keep our cohesion tight. Three, ensure that when we play the game, we make it safe and decent. We decry and we also debunk the position that it's a dirty game. It can be a clean game and we can play it clean. Number four, we should be able to play the game differently by counting our losses and counting our wins, no matter how small they are. And finally, be courageous. Let us you know, put our foot out there. It's hard, but I doff my heart to those women who have made it and we will continue to stand by them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, so that's Um So the next person I'll call is Dr. Shido Onuma. Please, Dr. Chido, can we keep it to one minute? <laughs> Thank uh, you. I'll try. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah, just to say, I thank the organizers uh, uh, for this and to say that we can't have enough of this kind of conversations. 
we need to realize that every victory that women have won, and indeed any victory that humans have won has been the product of struggle. We need to continue to do serious advocacy on this issue, but it's important that we realize that the woman or gender question is not a woman or gender question. It's a national question. It's not a struggle to be left for women alone. It's a national question. And to that extent, we need to be creative. We need to look for, you know, look at best practices or good practices around the world and see how we can tailor them. But it's important that we organize, organize, and organize to quote the internal words of our late uh, comrade and uh, older brother, Dr. Tajuddin Abdurrahman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have um, one last person before I um, wrap up um, this session today, and that is Mr. Adekunle Shotubo. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try with the uh, video this time and see what it does. Uh, but just like uh, Mr. Onuma and uh, IGR said out to have said, uh, I think one critical factor in all of this is legislation. Um, if you look at the countries that have succeeded, uh, they really worked on legislation. You know, it's, it's something different to try to sell a direction. And it's another thing to put in enabling legislation to ensure that it becomes something that has legal guidance and can be enforced. Uh, look at Rwanda. You know, they started by saying 30% of uh, positions in the parliament should go to women. Well, guess what? They ended up getting, I think it's between 48% and um, maybe even 50, 53% with, from 2000 and uh, from when they started up to 2016. So that has been wonderful. And I spoke about some of the gains in the oil industry. It came through policy, deliberate policy. Some of those policies are written as performance targets for senior managers and for people uh, in executive management. So it's not just to um, speak about it, it's to legislate it, uh, make it into policy, and then make, make sure that it is driven by people with conviction. And the only way you can do this is to organize, is to create awareness, and is also to look at the power structure of some of these parties, uh, some of these um, House of Assemblies, and seize that power structure. Uh, using your influence. Uh, that's, that, that's, that's what I think will work. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for having me. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for all your contributions. Our panelists, we have, I mean, thank you so much. I have learned so much, you know, uh, from your contributions, it's just great insight. So I will tell you just in a few words what I, I am living here with. I'm learning, I've learned today about intentionality. If we want to see more gender inclusive government governance, we have to be intentional about the way we raise our women, raise our allies. We need to be intentional about mentorship. We need to be intentional about legislation and the policies that recognize and understand what I hear is like the physiological um, differences that women have and um, the policies need to be made to accommodate that so that women can do their best, you know, in the political sphere. Um, and then lastly, in order to make all this possible, we need to organize, we need to continue to create awareness, we need to support, we need to participate. Thank you so very much, um, our panelists and discussants for your time and your contributions today and all the uh, questions. I see that many people still have questions. Please do not forget to drop the questions. We will attend to them after the um, event, the live event. But finally, I'm going to call on, uh, as you are aware, there's a competition called What She Can Do Competition. And I'm going to call on, Sorry, we need to get her name. <laughs> okay, so uh, the What She Can Do competition, first of all, we Esther. had mentioned it earlier, but- Her um, name is, sorry, her name is Esther, Ala, Esther Alaribe. Esther Alaribe. Alaribe. <coughs> Alaribe. Esther Alaribe from Women Radio FM. Okay, so yeah. she's going to unveil this competition. It's what 
she can do. So this is a competition where asking women from 18 years and above to make a one to two minute video, post it on their social media and tag the Akifade Foundation to tell us what they would do if they were given an opportunity to, you know, be in power as a president, a governor, a minister, any part of government. And then there's so many prizes to be won. She would go ahead and give us more information. Thank you so very much for joining us, all of you. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Insightful conversation so far. Well done, Miriam. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. All right, yes. As we have seen and we have heard, there is need now more than ever to ensure that we continue advocating for women inclusion in governance. So mm -hmm. many women interest groups, so many organizations. We have the Nigerian Women Trust Fund. This organization so far have been so, so actively involved in ensuring that women inclusion in governance is a thing. Just like Dr. Amina Salio mentioned and um, Hajia Sadao Tumadi, yes, the litigation process, we had about seven plaintiffs, plaintiffs who took the federal government to court, asking them to stick to their words on the 35% affirmative action for women. Yes, on the 6th of April, judgment was passed this year in favor of the women, but now we are getting reports that this judgment might be appealed very soon. What it means is, in a society where we have almost half of the population as women, we still find it very hard to give women 35%. When we have other African countries like Rwanda, South Africa, Senegal, doing more than that already. In Rwanda, we have about 50% of women already. But here in Nigeria, we still struggle with 35% affirmative action with, for women. When people ask, what can women do in the political space? There is a whole lot that women can actually do, but let's ask ourselves the questions. Let's look around in the political space. Are we really ready to give women that space? The lack of political will is just written everywhere. The leave service that we pay to women inclusion in governance. Yes, we see it everywhere, but to this end, narrowing it down to this competition tag, what women can do. Yes, now is the time for women to actually show up and tell the society what we can do. Every time you look around in your society, there is a woman somewhere doing something. The gender pay gap, the unpaid labor, so many things that women get to do that nobody even gives credit for, simply because you are a woman and you should actually do all of these things. Yes, so now we are unveiling this competition, what women can do. I'm urging us this afternoon, Tell every woman within your network, you can post it on your social media platforms. We encourage women within the ages from 18 and above, 18 and above. Yes, stick to your social media platforms, record just within one minute or two minutes, telling Nigerians what you would do if you were in the corridor of power, if you had access to the decision-making tables. Let's think about it this way. We have men on decision-making tables, making decisions for women. Yes, I know you can say you have a woman in your life, but you cannot see things clearer than a woman who is in that position. So yes, we want women to take to their Instagram pages, social media pages generally, telling us in a minute or two what you would do if you were on a decision-making table, the kind of policies you would implement, the kind of strategies you want to see that you would implement for national growth and development, the kind of provisions you will make for women and children persons living with disabilities, the young, the elderly, what kind of policies would you implement? What strategies? Yes, we know over time we've allowed the men take over the hems of affairs, but what have, what have they really done if we have been honest? What have the men done? It's not a competitive um, um, effort right now, but instead let's look at it as we collaborating. But over time, the political space has just been speckled against women. So now I'm urging us, let's tell more women about this. Let the women upload their videos on their social media pages, tag at AF Foundation NG, get people to like, comment and share, share the links to people so they can comment and also like it for you. Now, this is because we are going to be selecting based on the highest number of likes each video gets. So the more likes your video gets, the higher your chances of being selected. So first, 10 selections will be made. So the first stage entry will start today up until the 26th of July, 2022. Now, out of this 10 that are going to be selected, 
we're still going to pick five winners after a week based on your number of likes and engagements. I really look forward to the kind of ideas and strategies that women will be churning out based on this competition. We have a whole lot of us, we have about 97 of us currently on this platform. If all of us put together in our different spaces, our different platforms can tell more women about this competition. Think about the number of videos we'll have there. Very sure people will be wondering what exactly is going on. So yes, let's urge women to ensure that they start from today, start posting your videos and tag at AF Foundation NG on social media. And yes, we really hope that um, at the end of this, just like um, Mr. Akifade mentioned the other time, that we'll see women who will get into some kind of school position or get appointed because of the kind of brilliant ideas that they bring forward. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for that. Um, um, that is, and to everyone who is still on this call and has joined us up till now, that is the unveiling of this um, beautiful competition. And as our, um, as she has said, as Esther has said, please go forward to share this and ensure that everyone in your network um, is aware of this competition. And we're doing it uh, most importantly, not just for the likes. Actually, this is one of it, one competition that it's not about the likes. It's about pushing women's voices out there we want every woman to have a voice and we want their voices to be heard across all platforms into political spaces and let them start to see both young and um you know um uh, both young and old and let them start to see that these voices are important and maybe we start to integrate those same voices into the, pol the political space as they are so thank you so much for the competition and um, we're going to wrap up this um conversation and wrap up this event um by calling the executive director of akinfade foundation um to to have the floor for the closing remarks however before I say, before I hand over to him, once again, I want to say thank you to all our speakers. Please do not leave now. Uh, we're just going to have the closing remarks um, and then we can let you go. So thank you to speakers and thank you to all that have contributed. And for those who wanted to say more and contribute more, uh, we will tweet some of your contributions online um, after this event. So please ensure that you put them up on on our WhatsApp group on the screen. And also, if you have not taken out the time to do the attend, to fill out, out the attendance, that's how we're gonna be reaching out to you. So please do that. Thank you so much for that. Um, and finally, I'll give the, the mic um, over to Mr. Akin Fade um, to give us our closing remark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tommy, but where's the mic? On air. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I, the first thing I'd like to say is to express uh, my personal profound apologies to all of you who have your hands put up, but that were not able to uh, call. Uh, it's, it's just because we're dealing with, um, we're struggling with time. Uh, like I said, a lot of people have to wake up in the middle of the night, some didn't even sleep. Um, then there has to be a time, there has to be a time limitation for any event, right? You know, so I was I was chatting Miriam in the back end to say, Miriam, call them, call them, call them. But Miriam just snubbed me. <laughs> like, we have to wrap, you know, just so that people can face other things. But I assure you, this is not the last of this we're going to have an open house where we just throw it open for everyone to start airing their views it will not just be limited to panelists alone let me uh i, I had to start this conversation by giving you those apologies first because if you weren't here they would have no events now i will say that let me go to all my friends and guests that are here uh we are exceptionally grateful to Chief Mrs. Bandilo Latajo, the Honorable Commissioner for Information and Orientation in all those states, for being true to herself, for having that capacity to tell you, I will be there, and she's there. This is not our first engagement. We've always had 
uh, this kind of conversations and she will be there. She called me two days ago to say, I just want to confirm the time. I said 11 and that was it. She's here. Thank you so very much to my very good friend, uh, Lillian, Dr. Lillian Alamachi from TA Connect, Executive Director, uh, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, I can't thank you enough. You know, we've had this relationship for close to a decade and Lillian always came through in anything that we lay our hands on. Thank you. I like just saw that to Madi. Um, I, I call you auntie, you know, but you take me like a friend and uh, you're always so down to earth, but at the same time, so unassuming. Thank you so much. Mr. Adekunle Shotubo, thank you for always being there for us. Anything we post, you share it. Um, the way you play on Facebook, no one will even know your worth. <laughs> you, are, you, are, you are a huge role model in terms of humility and uh, how you combine that with rare intellect. I'm yet to understand. Uh, thank you so much, Tracy Dorchev, my very, very good friend, um, for staying awake to do this for us. You don't have an idea how flattered we are. Thank you so much for sharing insights from the diaspora. I'm sure that we're comparing notes and this can only turn out the best in all that we're trying to do in Nigeria. Thank you so much, Dr. Chido Onoma, for always responding with just a phone call from us. We're partners and will continue to be. And um, like I always say, the Akinfade Foundation's platform is open for continued consistent collaborations. And we are making available our capabilities for productions now to ensure we put out the works of partners. Please feel free to take tremendous advantage of this. Thank you so very much, uh, our board chairman, Mr. Simon Kolawale, for all the backend conversations we had and for making sure that uh, you, are, you've been, you, you make yourself to be part of this. Now, the last but not the least in law is Dr. Amina Salu. Um, we can't thank you enough. I've mentioned it, that Makato has invested heavily in Nigeria. Makato has invested heavily in us and we will continue to do this just so that will make it to be worth their while. Now the competition we've announced. Let me thank you all of you for partnering this voice to showcase yourself. Um, it is not about the gift that you will get. We've announced that there will be iPhone 13 to give the first position. There will be makeover wardrobe. Um, what 500,000 naira for the second position. There will be ST Lauder or Mac makeup, what 300,000 naira for third position. Fourth and fifth position will win gifts worth 150,000 and 100,000 naira, respectively. Um, <clears throat> the last five, <clears throat> excuse me, please. The last five that didn't make it, you know, we said, from all the entries we will receive, we shortlist the best 10. When you are submitting your video, speak about anything you're convenient about. You know you can bring positive impact into governance from agriculture, say it, from power, say it, electricity, from education, healthcare, security, whatever you're convenient with, say it, make your pitch. If I I'm the president. This is what I will do to make Nigeria better. What women can do. Two minutes, three minutes. Post it on your social media handle. Just tag us. Tag Akinfadi Foundation on Facebook. Tag all the social media handles that have been mentioned. We're still going to promote this on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. So just be on the lookout. When we select the entries, the 10 best will enter you into a grand finale and ask you to speak about what you do about corruption. And then we select the best five. But be sure of this. 
the first and to fifth position will win these prices and it's convertible to cash if that's what you want. The last five, you still get honorarium for participating. So it's not gonna be a winner's take all. Thank you for hacking to that voice for you to showcase yourself. Don't forget, because it's on the information superhighway, cyberspace, it will go everywhere. You have no idea which politician can call you to say, oh, wow, I like, I watched you on the internet. I like it to be SA something for me, SA power, SA agree, SA whatever. So you're going to get tremendous visibility from this because we will promote you heavily. So I thank you that you will join this. I can never thank my colleagues enough. The only reason we are able to do this job is because I have very, very wonderful colleagues. Oluwato Miyoko, our head of programs that is seated here, is ideally on maternity leave. We dragged her to come. I said, Tommy, sorry, you have to be part of this. Just so that when, if you keep you at home, you are not going to make another baby quickly, just come. <laughs> and she came, you know, and she's been part of the preparation. Dear Kolola, uh, uh, Brands and Communications Manager has been sleepless over this. Dear Kolola was still taking injections yesterday night. Yet, she's pulling this through with us. Our Finance and Accounts Manager, Ernest, is a utility machine. It does everything and everything. My colleagues, Kumbi and Courage, all wonderful people. Our graphics artist, Olua Kayode, can work till anytime. These are wonderful people that make it easy for this job to get done. I thank you very much, Mutunrayo, Alaka, from Wallace Institute for Journalism for being here and investigative reporting for being here. Thank you very much, Deola Fayeun, who's been partnering with us. Thank you very much, Miriam Lunge, from the co-host at TVC for making yourself available for all the conversations before we add this. Thank you, Miriam Adeboe from Kora State. Thank you, um, Halaja Sarumi, I mean, Lama Sarumi Jumai from Gahaj International Stores in Kora State. Thank you, Ganiolo. Thank you. I don't, I don't even know. I can just begin to mention names upon names. Thank you, Dr. B.C. Eshuro Show, who joined us from the United Kingdom. Thank you, Oluwato Nyabayomi. Thank you, Oluwato Ndidi. You are always there for us. Thank you, Bless Omawumi. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. So very much, Irad Admi. Thank you, Helen Oladele. Thank you, Tinu Badejo. Thank you, Coco. Thank you, Yemi Michael. Thank you, Sahida Adetayo. Shola Bodier and Rebecca. Ogeriaki Aisha, my very good friend from the United Kingdom. Thank you, Dr. Kule Ojele from Canada. Thank you, Nika. Thank you, <clears throat> Taiwade <clears throat> Bulu from the Cable. Thank you, Mary Amos, Anayo Ezugu, Bimpe, Tosin Tume, TF, Kelechi Deka. Thank you, Omoye Ohiku. Thank you. Thank you, Omolara Okuni. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, Falila Bakari. Thank you very much, John Siri Olo. Thank you, Grace Michael. Thank you, Olori Temitopade Wusi. Thank you, Deumi Lagos. Thank you, Jennifer Matthias. My big boss, Olola Diba Midele, thank you very much for all the back end support you give us. Thank you. Ejide Benga Mundari, thank you. Abisola, Legal Practitioners and Company. Wali Akinola, Deputy Editor Legit, thank you. Babalola Titi Lola, Babatunde Titi Lola. Happiness and Boji, thank you so much. Mr. Latunji Okwe, thank you. You sued Mubarak Authority. I saw your hand up. I'm sorry you were in court, but trust me, I'll give you opportunities to express yourself. Thank you for making it. Ninda Samuel, Awe Caroline, Chiwendu Esther, Dami Adamolekun, Mr. Wale Legede, Mr. Simbolo Femi, my good boss, Mrs. Fumi Hector Olukoya, Funke Temi Olushola, thank you for all you do for us. Um, Gorgeous, OJ, thank you. Thank you so much. Women Radio, you deserve an applause. Give a very strong and big regards to um, Tom Okewale for lending all the support to us. We're just starting. 
uh, we have a lot of promo to do uh, because of this competition. Thank you, the Nigerian media, for being here. Thank you for all the support you've been giving us. Thank you for always making yourself available as a strategic vehicle of communications. We really appreciate everyone. I would like to wrap by saying this. Lee Kuan Yew said to Singaporean youths, when you want to marry, marry an educated woman. The meaning of that is this. For you to be able to seize political power, you need to consistently improve yourself. The world has gone far. It is only those who can bring intellect to the table that can bring about innovation for change. So please, we will offer a platform for you to get out there or improve yourself. The data you use on Facebook, use it to improve yourself. Be part of this competition. You'll be glad you did. On this note, I say till we meet again in a very short time from here, bye from me. Thank you. Thank you so much to the executive director and CEO um, of Akinfade Foundation, Mr. Akinfade himself. We really appreciate you and thank you for all the support you have given us to this event. Um, thank you all for joining us. I think that we have come to the end of this program. Once again, thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to our moderator. Thank you to our personnel, you participants, um, because this event will not have been possible without you. So thank you so much. Um, once again, please, look at the terms and conditions of the of the competition and join us as we go forward with this competition thank you so so much and also as partners and organizations we are open for collaboration so um should you want to collaborate with us in promoting this event or collaborate us with us in doing many other things that we do at akifari foundation um, we would love to have you um thank you so much and have a wonderful day ahead thank you Have you been out to vote? <clears throat> no, no. So tell me, what is my patriotic husband still doing at home while the elections are ongoing? Oh, well, I've been following the television analysis. Ruben Kilibati hmm. is speaking grammar. And you? I gave them my own arguments. Oh, and they could not take it. You claim you want different results, yet you won't change the pattern. All the ones that were voted mm -hmm. until now, mm -hmm. you know, just elections are not won by, by arguing on social media. Mm -hmm. Elections are won when you take that your one single vote and add it to a pool of larger votes. That's how you win elections. Mm. Get me my cup. Mm. This message is from Akin Day Foundation with support from Mark Arthur Foundation. From north to east, from south east to south. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this history-defining moment. Let's ask ourselves this critical question. If Nigeria was a business since independence, would we say that our leadership have turned it into a profitable venture? Today, we take Nigeria as seriously as we take a business. We are therefore on a search for who will become the next president of Nigeria <laughs> would ask each of our candidates to step up and tell us why we should vote for them as the next president of Nigeria. 
I want to be your president because it is my turn. I'm a chartered accountant and um, I have a PhD and three degrees from the University of London. <laughs> yes, I'm very learned. If we elect you as our president, what do you go do for us? Tell us. Tell us. After this, you come to me, uh, I'll change your life. Yes, I believe it's a tit for tat. You know, you rub my back, I rub your back. Uh, you know? Because you can't know me and I'm in power and I will not help you. The woman who stands before you today is a strong advocate for meritocracy and true democracy. I have the capacity to serve and to lead the good citizens of this country and to ensure that we make Nigeria great. Since our independence, over 400 billion dollars of oil revenue has been lost to corruption. Amongst many other factors, I personally think that there are three factors that are very critical to national development. We have stable power, we have smooth transportation system, and mechanized agriculture. I do not need to stress the need to radically diversify this economy. Yes, we need to turn efforts from, from the ever fluctuating oil exports and concentrate, focus our efforts on growing other revenue generating sectors that can make viable exports. What are we doing as a community, as a nation, to make sure our young do not decline into drugs and delinquency? Because you see, education is the passport to a future. And that is why my team, I will work tirelessly with a well-meaning team that would ensure that innovative educational opportunities are put at the fore my sisters, my brothers, you see brain, you see hearts, they are not get gender. Yes. Good governance, no get gender. Yes. yes. Anybody, male or female, that is passionate, patriotic and capable can lead this country. As long as we have the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, especially our brothers and sisters living with disabilities at the focus of our policy, anybody, male or female, can lead this country. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if I am elected, rest assured that I will run a government that is accountable, transparent, and is given solely to the equitable fight against corruption. <laughs> it will be my privilege to serve you Nigerians. <laughs> Madam, go and take your form. We will vote for you. Yes. This message is from Akin Fadei Foundation with support from Mark Arthur Foundation.